Hi guys, welcome back to another video. Uh, thanks for coming back. We're going to go ahead and continue moving forward in our study um, talking about the twin Zerah from Tamar and Judah. Um, just as a recap, we have um, been pointed to this by the Lord. Um, he gave me the name O'Hare. Um, I understood that it was an Irish clan. Um, he said that um, O'Hare is representative of him. Um, he said that when I asked if it was a tribe, he asked me to go look it up. Um, he did say I was one of them. So coming upon some of the information that we're going through, we are um, following along with the bloodline of the two um, twins that were born um, from Judah. Okay, we have Zerah that was born with the scarlet cord around its wrist, uh, supposed to be the firstborn, but somehow did not come out to be the firstborn. Perez was the firstborn that came out. We've been looking at these um, the bloodline and the movement of people on this particular chart um, of several times now, so it shouldn't be um, a brand spanking new to you. We know that the house, the royal house of Zerah and Judah is here. Um, the royal house of Perez and Judah is here. Um, we know that David is from this line. David had two sons, Solomon and Nathan. And Nathan, down the line, brought forth the Virgin Mary, which we know the Lord Jesus Christ came through. Um, we see here Levi and Aaron, which is um, the priesthood. Simon the Just, it comes in here, um, ties into that line, and then comes down into here. Um, and now we see Joseph of Arimathea, and we are familiar with that name, especially around the cross. But notice what name is right underneath Joseph of Arimathea, and the word is Anna. Now, you guys have heard me say, um, when I have been talking about the saints of old um, being here on this earth, assisting us and helping us, I went to the Lord upon hearing that and said, Lord, who is here helping me? And he told me, Anna. Now, I didn't even know who Anna was. I didn't know, had no idea who she was at that time. I was able to go in and find uh, Anna, the prophetess, in the Bible um, right around the time of Jesus' birth. Well, there we go. That's where it is. And so this, is, this must be that Anna. So I wanted to go ahead and show that to you. Okay, I thought that was pretty important. They come down here to the Royal House of Tudor. Um, and then work their way in back into the to the line for the Royal House of Windsor. Zerah will come down, and we are following, getting ready to start following this line where we will understand that the Trojan kings um, are in this particular line. Some of these here are also in this line, but I'm not going to really be going into this particular area as of now. What I'm going to be going into is where the Lord is leading me, which is into the Melisande Kings and then to where this line comes back in to the royal house of Ferez and Judah to become not two houses but one and then coming into the kings of Ireland and the kings of Scotland because that is where the Lord has been leading me. Okay? I want you guys to remember that the Lord said he's going to let people know who you are. That's what he told me, and that is what he has told others, okay? So if if this is resounding within you, and this is speaking to you, or maybe some of the information that I'm going to be providing for you, okay, is, um, is connecting with something that the Lord has told you, um, shown you, led you in study, or given you dreams, visions, or what have you, um, then I definitely want to encourage you to dig in deeper. Okay? So now, guys, I have a lot to cover right now. I've got my grandchildren here at the house. Um, it's getting kind of late. I need to get 
um, this particular video out. It is um, going to be a detailed video. I wanted to make sure that the backup documentation was here and that we were talking about things as we're going along. I am going to list that three hour video as a link so that you guys can see what I sat through and took many, many, many upon many pages of notes from. It was from that video um, and that I went and started digging into other things. Okay, um, I dug into scripture, I dug into many different things. And so I will show you the things that I have found um, and talk to you about some of this stuff. Now, what I'm going to provide in this video is not everything that I have. Um, I have I have some other things that I need to prepare for that I haven't had a chance to do yet. And then I have some I have been speaking to another brother in Christ um, about some information that I haven't even had a chance to even tap into yet. So, um, Lord willing, if I still have the time, okay, and the permission to do so, then I will bring all of that forth. So, guys, there is a lot of information here. Um, it's going to speak to certain people. Okay, I, I'm going to say that to you right now. It's going to speak to certain people. Please be aware. Okay, all right, so let's just get started. So the first thing that I want to talk about um, is I want to talk about that the word apocalypse, okay, that big scary word that everyone doesn't like, that word apocalypse means uncover, reveal, or expose. So I'm going to pull it up. The word apocalypse means uncover, reveal, or expose. So let's take a look here. The origin, Old English via Old French, um, to uncover, to reveal. Okay? Um, so I wanted to just bring that to you so that when you're looking at apocalypse and you're thinking, oh my God, it's this final complete destruction of the world and all of that, blah, blah, blah. I want you to know from where the origin of that word comes from. Okay. We know that the book of Revelation means to reveal, right? So, um, so when we look at some of these words and we're digging into some of this stuff, I don't want everyone just to be freaking out. Oh my gosh. You know, you know, that word is so scary. Well, let's look into that word and see exactly what where what it means. OK. All right. So now a new generation is about to reawaken to their Hebrew Galaic roots. OK, um, this is what we're going to be talking about. So let's go into um, scripture first. Genesis 17, the sign of the covenant. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham, to Abram. Oops, so his name hadn't been changed yet. When he was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. Now, when you go and look up the word Ab Abraham, it does indeed mean um, a father of many nations. Okay, and so um, and so when the Lord told called me O'Hare. Um, and he told me it meant his forevermore. And then when we looked it up, it did indeed mean um, a long lasting and forever. Um, so, guys, it's very, very important. And it's important to the Lord um, and that these things happen. OK, so Abraham is is the father bloodline of generations. Would you agree? Um, it is his planted seed that would become the great genealogy tree of nations, both friend and foe. So Abraham's son was Isaac, and from Isaac came the simple shepherd Jacob, who was enlightened uh, in the desert by the divine spirit with the stairway to heaven. So you guys remember, um, he he went to, he had a dream and he saw that 
ladder going up to heaven and um, uh, the angels up and down. Um, let's take a look at that. That should be Genesis. Um, is this it? Genesis 28. Yes. Let's look at verses 12 to 14. And he dreamed and behold, a ladder set up on earth and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. So basically he was seeing an open heaven. He was seeing this ladder going from earth to heaven and that it was an open heaven. These angels were going up and down it. Uh, verse 13, And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest to thee, will I give it, and to thy seed. Let's go to verse 14. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So he saw that stairway to heaven by by the Holy Spirit, by the dream, by being having his eyes opened uh, spiritually while he was sleeping, however it was. But he saw that. Okay. So the timeline, which is important to us today, um, is as follows. In 1953 BC, a special witness was present to record um, this particular historical and sacred event. So what was that witness? Um, this was the stone of circumstance um, called the destiny stone. Okay, so this stone was a witness. All right, this stone was a witness. Some call it the stone of destiny. Some call it the stone of scone. Let's see if this is my tab here. Here we go. When I typed in stone of destiny, it came up stone of scone, Scottish Gaelic. Okay, this is what this is where we're being led to. Um, at Leah Falls, Scots, it's talking about here's what the stone actually looks like. Let's take a look at it. It's this part, this top part here. Um, and so they have replicas of it. This is the one that is in Ireland. Um, so it appears to be piece, two pieces of it. Some people say it had already been broken in half and others say different. Uh, so I'm not real sure exactly um, everything with that. But let's, um, let's take a look at this Wikipedia. So the Stone of Scone. Um, also known as the Stone of Destiny, and often referred to in England as the Coronation Stone, is an oblong block of red sandstone that was used for centuries in the coronation of the monarchs of Scotland, and then later the monarchs of England and those of the United Kingdom. Okay, so it is something that they place within um, some type of coronation um, stone. So let's go back to Genesis 28. I want to I want to take a look. Whoops. Go back to Genesis 28 um, and look at verse 11 uh, to see what he said here. And then we're going to look at verse 18. So talking about this stone um, and he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set and he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. So his head was on upon this stone, okay, when he lay down to go to sleep and he had this dream, okay. So it was almost as if the stones were speaking to him. Uh, let's go into Genesis 28, uh, 18. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of it. Okay, so what he's done is he's anointed this. Let's click into what oil is, um, because this is going to show that, yes, indeed, he did anoint it. Oil is an anointing, um, an anointing, um, uh, uh, gosh, I'm, I'm coming up lost for word, uh, an anointing, um, 
uh, thing. Let, let me just use that. I was I was thinking some other word, but for some reason it's it's left me. So um, so it appears that he anointed that particular uh, that particular stone. So in Jacob's biblical biblical history of his dream. A spir a, this spiraling ladder comes down from heaven, and at the foot of this divine ladder lay a foundation witness stone that he used as his headrest. So this is Jacob's pillar stone, which he found in the desert and now would witness the beginnings of history of all Judah crowned kings and genes to come. So Jacob's name was transferred to the name of Israel, meaning child of God, and would now be the father to the children that would make up the 12 tribes and great nations um, till the end of time. Okay, so let's look at um, Genesis 35, and we're going to look at these verses here, 9 through 15. Then God appeared to Jacob again, and he came from Padam Aram. Now, that's where he was sent to go get his wife, okay? So when he came from that place, um, God blessed him. And God said to him, your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. And so he called his name Israel. So God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall precede you, and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac I give you, and to your descendants after you I give this land. Then God went up from, from him in the place where he talked with him. So Jacob set up a pillar in that place where he talked with him, a pillar of stone. And he poured a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it. And Jacob called the name of that of that place where God spoke to him Bethel. Okay, so we are familiar with Bethel. Uh, Bethel is is one of the little um, towns that Elijah had some of his prophets in. If you guys recall uh, the scriptures where um, they were going to all those different towns, uh, Elijah and Elisha, just before Elijah was was caught up. So um, so we are familiar with that with that name. Let's take a look at an emphasis on verse number 11. I really want I really want you all to see what he is saying here. Verse number 11. Also God said to him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. Okay, now wait a minute. Now what's he saying? A nation and a company of nations shall precede you. Okay, come back again. A nation and a company of nations shall precede you, and kings shall come out of your body. Okay? So keep that in mind. So the sons of Israel are Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulon, Dan, Joseph, Benjamin, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. And over time, the tribes of Reuben and Simeon um, would break um, some of the laws of Israel and lose their leadership and tribal titles. Um, I don't want to get into those stories. This is just something that you all can look into um, on your own. Um, so let me see. Let me follow. Let me follow. Okay. So Jacob and his descendants, um, mm -mm. Jacob finds out about his lost son Joseph still being alive. Okay, so you guys remember that story. Joseph was the one with the coat of many colors, and he got those two dreams that others would be bowing down to him, etc., etc., and um, and his and his brothers got got jealous of him, and they got tired of hearing what you know what he was saying, and they threw him in a pit, right? And they sold him off. Um, they sold him off as a slave, but they took the coat that he was wearing and dipped it in blood, and took it back to Jacob, his father, and said, you know, 
Joseph is dead. He's got, you know, he got eaten by wild animals or what have you. And, um, which was a lie, but that is what his brothers did. And I'm going to tell you, that's, that's some pretty tough stuff right there, guys. Uh, that's, that's heartache stuff, you know? Um, but so let's, let's take a look then, um, at Genesis 45. I think that's, is this it? Yeah. Uh, no, that's 49. Let's, let me see. Do I have Genesis 45? Um, that's 48. Let's just go right here. 45. Sorry, guys. Thought I would have it all together. Um, so Joseph sees his brothers. Remember, there was that seven years of famine. Joseph um, was the only one that was, when he was in prison, got thrown into prison um, because of the Pharaoh's wife, um, not liking the fact he wasn't taking on her advances. And so he got thrown into prison. And so while he was in prison, uh, someone had, a, the Pharaoh had a dream and he was the only one that was able to tell him what the dream was about. And it was, it was about, there was going to be seven good years um, for crops. And then there was going to be seven years of famine and that he needed to prepare for that. And so Joseph was put over that. And, um, and so during that seven years of famine, um, Joseph's brothers were coming in to get grain uh, in Egypt where he was. And he recognized them. And, um, and this was right around the time when they told him that, um, that Joseph was still alive. And so here it is in verse 25. They went up out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to Jacob, their father. And they told him, saying, Joseph is still alive and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart stood still. Well, don't you know it did? I mean, he thought his son had been torn to pieces by a wild animal um, because he didn't believe him. Now, you know, I don't I don't. I don't know. I would just be like, are you kidding me? What are you saying to me? Uh, but when they told him all the words that Joseph had said to him, and when he saw the carts which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob was uh, of their father revived. And then Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. Well, praise God he was able to. Um, to go and see him before he died. Uh, let me come into Genesis 49. Where's where's all my tabs? This is so sad. Um, let me go back into 49. Um, this is where Jacob is starting to bless uh, Joseph. Okay, let's look down in 24. Okay, here we go. Now, we talked about this one already. I've showed you this particular scripture already. Um, I looked, I was telling you about Reuben and what happened there. I went in and I, we read Judah's um, blessing from his father. And we talked about the scepter shall not depart. We talked about that until Shiloh comes. So we are a little bit familiar here. I'm not going into the depths of it, but I'm just trying to show you. And then... Um, uh, we came down and that Ju Joseph was a fruitful bow, a bow, a fruitful bow by a wall, etc. And so we talked about this a little bit. Um, but let's look to see what his father was continuing to say. So the archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him and hated him. Um, but his bow remained in strength and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. Okay. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Okay. Now, that's a very interesting statement. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Um, I myself am going to be digging into that a little bit more. Um, but I'm going to ask that you guys dig into that a little bit more. Let's, so he's, he, so Jacob is blessing Joseph here. Now that he has realized he's alive, he is one of the ones, one of his sons that he is blessing along with the others. Um, so then he comes in to start to bless, um, not only 
uh, not only Joseph, but Joseph's two sons. Now Joseph has two sons. He has um, he has Ephraim and Manasseh, and so Joseph is also going to um, bless his two sons. Um, and they he said in the blessing basically that they would stand as two separate tribes of Israel, and one day would be two great nations. Um, and so I know that this is the United States and Britain, and, and not just Britain, but the United States and the Commonwealth. And we'll take a look at some of that, too, because we're going to show that the Commonwealth is more than one nation. Okay, so let's just go on down and see what the blessing is. Um, he brings his he brings his sons there and who are these and Joseph said to his father these are my sons whom God has given me in this place meeting in Egypt and he says well pre please bring them to me so I can bless them and so um, what he did is um, let's read here so Joseph brought them from beside his knees and he bowed down with his face to the earth and Joseph took them Ephraim with his right hand toward Israel's left hand and Manasseh with his left hand toward Israel's right hand and brought them near to him then Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head now now mind you the right hand is the blessing okay that is that is the main firstborn blessing that 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 right hand goes with and so when he laid it on Ephraim's head um, who was the younger son he laid his left hand on Manasseh's head guiding his hands knowingly for Manasseh was the firstborn and he blessed Joseph and said um, he blessed them and said God before whom my father Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has fed me all my, long, all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, let my name be named upon them, and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. And now Joseph saw that his father had laid the right hand on the head of Ephraim, and it displeased him. So he took the took a hold of his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head, to place it on Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, Not so, my father, for the one for this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He, sh he also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. So yet again, um, we have another crisscross of things. Um, where the firstborn is not the firstborn and what have you. So um, so we know that Britain and the Commonwealth are great nations, uh, but the United States has become huge. It has become a very great nation. The Lord has blessed us beyond belief. Um, you know, we, a lot of things have happened since that time, and we have fallen, no doubt. Um, but I... I just wanted to bring this to your attention that that is who he's speaking of. So let's go um, down to verse 21 and 22. Then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I am dying, but God will be with you and bring you back to the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to you one portion above your brothers, which I took from the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. So God will lead him back to the land of his ancestors, okay? God will lead him back to the land um, of his ancestors. So very interesting uh, information here. So the voyage of Zerah, okay, um, is Zerah is the father to the Gaelic tribes of Western Europe, okay? And we're talking about here. Zerah, okay? His father was Judah, who was a son of Jacob. That's who we've been talking about, Jacob, okay? 
So I'm, I'm just trying to keep it connected here. I'm just trying to make sure you're, you're sticking with me on it. So now, Zara's voyage starts when he was born as a twin, okay, in 1883 B.C. to the tribe of Judah. Okay, remember the Tamar. We read about that. We read about the red string. He came out first, da-da-da, but these were twins. They were twin boys. So his twin is called uh, Perez. And Perez, other names of Perez mean Phyllis, Felix, Philomena, Philemon, and uh, uh, Pero. Okay, so let's look at um, Genesis. Uh, let's look at Genesis 38. Where are we at here? Uh, let's see, is this 38? No, of course not. Let's go in here. Ah, here we go. Genesis 38. So just as a brief highlight, we, we went into Genesis 38 quite a bit the other day. Um, about Judah and Tamar and how she dressed herself as a harlot, um, how she asked for the things to, um, to hold as surety before she could get the payment of her goat. Do you remember that? And what the, what was that surety pledge? The surety pledge was, um, was the, um, let me see if I can find it here. It was his, it was his signet. It was his cord and his staff or his, yeah, his staff or something like that. Do you guys remember that? Okay, so just, just saying that that's what it is right here. Okay, oh, here it is, the signet, the cord, and the staff. And we went into detail as to about what that was. And remember, the Lord has just said that something very, very similar to that. So now, while I was digging into some of that, I need to let you know that when, as soon as I had pulled up that Genesis 38 um, yesterday morning, while in study, the Lord said, you need to look at Strong's 38. I said, all right. So I went in and I pulled up, uh, I pulled up Strong's 38. So here's what I have. I have Greek 38, um, right? And then I have Hebrew 38. So I'm like, well, all right, so we're going to take a look at that. So um, I pulled up Greek 38, and let's see what it means. So Strong's 38, Greek 38. Now remember, Genesis 38 was about Tamar and the two twins, right? The two twin sons from, from Judah, right? Okay, so the Lord is telling me to look in to now Strong's 38. And so Strong's Greek 38 means consecration. It means sanctification. It means the process of making or becoming holy, set apart, sanctified, holiness, and consecrated. Um, it says here, sanctification, the process of advancing in holiness, use of the believer being progressively transformed by the Lord into his likeness, similarity of nature. Now, I almost, I, I couldn't believe what I was reading. I could not believe what I was reading. The Lord is telling me there's something significant to this number and to that particular chapter. He is still, he is still confirming this for us. So guys, this is the pathway that we're supposed to be on. This is what he is trying to show us. So notice what it says here. It says C40, right? So I went into 40, naturally, because I'm curious like that. And it says, sacred, holy, set apart by or for God, holy and sacred. Okay, let's continue. Likeness of nature with the Lord because different from the world. I thought, oh my goodness. Uh, set apart, therefore different because special to the Lord. Okay, so guys, I, I'm telling you, there is something about this bloodline that we're that we're following down. I'm telling you, there's something very, very significant about it, and I need for y'all to seek the Lord on it because it's something, it's something extremely strong within me. Let's go ahead and go into the Hebrew 38 and let's see what that has to say. Father of the sea, an Israel El Israelite name, Father of the sea. So let's come down here. It says, for Ab and Yam, father is Ab, seaman is Yam. So father of the sea, a seaman, or Abijah, which is a king of Judah. 
<laughs> okay, so uh, we have holy and consecrated and what have you on one side, and we have this on the other. Um, guys, very, very interesting, very interesting stuff. If I look at Ab, um, and this is where it's telling me about a father. Uh, notice <laughs> capital F. Um, I'm looking at all of this. I'm saying, wow, this is pretty interesting. I go into the other one where it's yam. Uh, I say yam. It could could be pronounced some other way. Um, and it says, uh, look, look what it says here, guys. Red. Now we've been talking about scarlet, right? Red. Sea, sea coast, seashore. West, west side, western, westward. Okay, I see south here, but I'm looking at all of these two. So, um, so where did we just hear that? We just heard that. We just heard that. Um, when I was going through reading, um, this was like it was a um, uh, Zara is the father to the Gaelic tribes of Western Europe. Now, amazing stuff. Keep this stuff in mind. Because, guys, I'm going to tell you that I, why would I, I would never have thought to look up uh, Strong's 38 when I was looking in Genesis 38. That was the Lord instructing me to do it, and there's a reason why. This is yet more hints. More things that he wants us to pay attention to. Guys, we are on the right track. There's something significant here, and you need to seek the Lord on it. Okay? All right. So we know Zerah was the firstborn of Judah, but his twin brother Perez would breach his birthright and come out of his mother's womb first. Okay? So we're, we're understanding that. That story has been, we've tried to review that story several times. So now, let's talk about um, Perez. Um, Perez becomes the bloodline of the Jews, okay? And kings over Judah and other tribes of Israel. Zerah, on the other hand, was the firstborn, but has a whole other history timeline. So the one thing that I want you to remember about Zerah, okay? Let's come back to this, is that it's connected back to the main bloodline with who? With Judah, okay? And so we, and also then if it's Judah, then it's also Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham. Correct? All right. So Zerah's descendants are tribes that make up all Gaelic, Celtic, Saxon, and Norseman tribes that cultivated Europe's first civilized people and nations and seamen. So remember Strong's 38? What did it say? Sea, seamen, sea coast, all of that. Okay. They still had some Egyptian origin too because they were there. Um, but now the voyage of Zerah is about the Hebrew tribes of Judah. Now, Perez became the bloodline of the Jews. Okay. But the voyage of Zerah is about the Hebrew tribes of Judah. Recall that the ten, the ten tribes of Israel, the northern ten tribes split. Israel and Judah split. And so ten tribes went to the northern kingdom. Okay, but the other two stayed with Judah and they were just called Judah. Okay, and those two were Judah and Benjamin. All right. Okay, so the story of the voyage of Zerah is about the Hebrew <coughs> tribes of Judah and not about the Jews and the tribes of Israel before and after the great exodus out of Egypt. Okay, hear the distinction of the two. Zerah is about the Hebrew tribes of Judah. Perez is about the bloodline of the Jews. Okay, because there is a difference between Hebrew and Jew. So let's take a look at that. <clears throat> See if I can find something that could help explain it. Okay, the difference between a Hebrew and a Jew. The key difference. The Jewish people are the Jews. 
a nation and an ethno-religious group descended from the Hebrews. Okay, so they came out of the Hebrews. So not all Hebrew people are Jews. Okay, Abraham was not a Jew. He, he, was, he was identified in the scriptures as a Hebrew. Okay, so not all Jews are, uh, are not all Hebrew people are Jews. Okay, but all Jews are Hebrew people. Okay, hear me when I tell you. Okay, I know that sounds confusing, but let's look at it like this. And this is from that big video that I'm going to attach. He gave a perfect example of this. He said, not all Americans are Tennesseans, <clears throat> but all Tennesseans are Americans. Okay, that's the same thing. That's the same thing with the Jews and the Hebrew people. So what we need to understand is that these are two distinct groups of people with, and they have two different, completely different roles to play. Okay? They do. So um, two different roles to play. I won't say completely different, but they have two different roles to play. Two distinct groups of people, two different roles to play. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> So, when we look at the voyage of Zerah, we're going to be looking in the Hebrew tribes of Judah, and not about the Jews and the tribes of Israel, whether it was before or after the great exodus out of Egypt. Because that story of the Jews and the Israelites is the history and journey of Zerah's twin brother, Perez. Okay? And it's covered in the times of Moses and onward to David and Jesus and, and about the ten tribes of Israel. <clears throat> We're going to be talking about Zerah because that is where the Lord is leading me. Okay. Zerah's roots are Hebrew with a direct royal bloodline to Judah, Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham. Okay. We're going to look at it again. Okay. Hang on. I messed up. Let's look it up. Let's look at it again. Okay. <clears throat> so, Zerah's roots are Hebrew with a direct royal bloodline to Judah, Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham. <clears throat> okay? All right. So let's talk about Zerah's son. Zerah had five sons. All right? And his sons are the first great Gaelic tribes of the Mediterranean, also called the Hiberians, which is Ireland and northern Spain, uh, which is Iberian. Let's take a look at that. Let me see if I can, um, oh, let me see if I got a map here. <clears throat> I should have probably said here, like, is this a map? Yes. Hey, how about that? Okay, so the Iberian Peninsula, that is northern Spain. Okay, you can see Madrid and all of that in there. So this is the Iberian Peninsula. <clears throat> so Zerah's son were the first Gaelic tribes of the Mediterranean um, <clears throat> to be in Ireland, which is up over here. And that is called Hiberians. And the Iberians, which is down in here. Okay, so Spain. So now we also know that some of his sons were over here in the Eastern Black Sea. Zimri was over here. Darda of Troy was down in here. Troy is somewhere around in this area. And he had this strait right here. This little waterway that went here, that was under his control. And then Athens, which is Greece, um, <clears throat> which is down in here, was also one of the other sons. And so... So all of these areas had Gaelic, Kimric, or Zimric stem languages cultivated through them. Um, cultivated through them. So Zerah's Hebrew, Hebrew Gaelic, Gaelic roots spread throughout the Mediterranean and present-day Europe. Now when you listen to that video, he's going to tell you not once, not twice, but probably three times, okay? Excuse me, about... <clears throat> that particular language that was that was uh, that was done and and spoken of by Zerah's tribes is the same language um, that the Hebrew people speak. 
it's the same it's the same language just in a different accent it's the same thing so um <clears throat> so it's very very interesting um, that they can go into any of these places and talk with people in, in that particular language and be able to pick it up and not need an interpreter only because now it's just the difference of the uh, of the pronunciation of the words so I thought that was very very interesting uh, <clears throat> all right <clears throat> excuse me so the the original tribes and nations of Europe all have this Gaelic Celtic Saxton and Egyptian roots and language but most of us have forgotten this or have not been taught about it at all I wasn't taught about it as a matter of fact, I wasn't taught about this particular um, bloodline whatsoever. The only reason why I'm on it is because the Lord has led me here. He has told me. He has given me bits and pieces and information. Um, last year sometime when I was asking him where I needed to study, he told me to start in Genesis. And I said, well, why, Lord? And he said, because you're in there. Well, where is all of these scriptures that I've been pulling up? It's out of Genesis. I didn't know what he was talking about at that time, and it's not until now when he told me I was part of that, that I even understand that's what's going on. And I really wouldn't have even understood that, except that many, many times coming into this, he said, I'm going to be showing people who you are. I thought it might be something different, might be something else, and it still may be something else, but he is showing his people who they are. And so we have to take time to listen, and we have to take time to dig into it, guys, and seek the Lord about it. We need to seek the Lord about it. <clears throat> okay, let me come back. The Voyage of Zerah um, is going back to study the beginnings of the true path in order to uncover the truth for today. Okay, And it really does start with the biblical story of Jacob of Israel. His connection with that pillar stone in the desert Okay, the one that we talked about, um, the stone that would become the witness stone for coronation for all future kings, uh, king's thrones of Judah and Israel till the end of time. So the British royal house and its ancestors have had the same pillar stone under its throne since Jacob. Uh, now, <clears throat> there is something that was brought up that in 1950 um, it went to Scotland and then um, some people say that it's still there. Let's take a look and see what I'm talking about. Um, this is the throne that is in Britain. This is the coronation chair. And notice that there's the stone. Okay. Um, any Anyone that is becoming a ruler, a king or a queen, must have this under them. OK, um, it is a coronation stone that is a witness stone for all kings thrones of Judah and Israel. So now let's take a look at that, because isn't England the house of Judah? OK, that is the line of Judah. All right. So there's that stone. There's another picture here I want to show you. She's actually on it. <clears throat> This is her, very, very young, coronation of her. She's sitting on that, and that stone is under her. Okay? All right. So very interesting information. Let's, um, let me, let me go back to where I was. All right. <clears throat> now, the British throne calls Jacob's pillar stone the coronation stone. Okay? The Scottish throne calls it the Stone of Scone, okay? But the Northern Ireland folks have a name for this, and they call it Leah Fale, the Bethel Stone. Well, that makes sense, because that was where, um, that was where he found it, right? He found it in that area of Bethel. Let's go into Genesis 28, um, <clears throat> and we're going to look here where the Lord is telling him to go and get a wife. <clears throat> oh, excuse me, it's not the Lord. It is Isaac. Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise and go to Padam Aram. Remember, we saw that word already. To the house of Bethel, thy mother's father, 
and take thee a wife from thence the daughters of Laban, um, your mother's brother. <clears throat> okay, so he's telling, he's telling him to go. Um, here's the blessing if he does. And God Almighty bless thee and make thee fruitful and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people. <clears throat> a multitude of people. Now that's a that's a big word there about the multitude. Um, an assembly, a congregation, a convocation, um, <clears throat> an organized body. Now if you listen to that long video, he says that the synonym for this word assembly is commonwealth. <clears throat> that's what he's saying. That the synonym for this is commonwealth. I'm sorry, I'm looking at my notes here. Um, <clears throat> so, what do I have? What do I have here? Hang on. Uh, okay, so here's the coronation stone. Leah failed for the um, uh, <clears throat> for the folks in Northern Ireland, and I highlighted just this little part here. I want to read this. It says, British Israel proponents and the worldwide Church of God under this particular person claimed that this stone was brought to Ireland by Jeremiah, the prophet, after the fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonians. In the church booklet entitled The United States in Britain and Prophecy, <clears throat> the following statement was made. Besides the royal family, Jeremiah brought with them some remarkable things, including a harp, now that's interesting, an ark, and a wonderful stone called Leah Fale, or Stone of Destiny. Many kings in history of Ireland, Scotland, and England have been coronated sitting over this stone, including the present queen. The stone rests today in Westminster Abbey in London, and the coronation chair is built over it and around it. A sign beside it labels it Jacob's Pillar Stone. <clears throat> okay. So, notice here it says that it's still in Ar it's still here. Notice that it. Uh, some say it's back in Ireland uh, uh, or Scotland. I'm sorry. I, I don't know exactly, but I really didn't want to go down that rabbit trail because I have enough on my plate at this time. So if you guys are interested in going in and studying it, please do. Um, I think it would be uh, something that would be good to know. Okay, so let's uh, let's see where else I need to go from here. <clears throat> um, Bethel Strong. We want to take a look at that on 28.9. <clears throat> Let's see, where is it? Here. And he will call the name of that place Bethel. Let's take a look at what Bethel means. Bethel means house of God. That's what it means. It means house of God. Um, so very interesting information. We know that names of things are very important. We know that numbers of things are very important. We know that the Lord will be speaking to you a message and he will hide nuggets right in there um, for you to pick up on and run with. Um, so I, I, I just, I ask that you guys continue to, to press in with your studies on this. All right, so let's continue a little more. So the pillar stone first entered uh, the north of Ireland in 583 BC, and this is when uh, the pillar stone turned up with Princess T. Tefi, Tep, Tep High maybe, um, and her great -grand grandfather, the prophet Jeremiah. Okay, so here's I had no idea. I I had no idea. I have not dug into um, much of Jeremiah in in regards to this, but. I was really excited to see uh, the prophet Jeremiah in this. I have always felt that there was a connection with Jeremiah and myself and Isaiah and myself. Um, well, Jeremiah and myself and then Isaiah was probably one of my favorite books. And so um, and so I wanted to to bring up that this is a pretty interesting thing because T, uh, I'm just going to call her T. She's the great granddaughter of prophet Jeremiah. Okay, um, and the pillar stone entering in the north of Ireland by her hand and 
by Jeremiah. This is this is a big story. We're going to want to talk about it. So I'm just going to call her T. But T was a descendant from Perez's line. Okay. T was from this side. Okay. So now a marriage for the princess then took place that healed a 2,500 year old breach between the original twins of Judah through a historical marriage in Ulster, North Ireland. In Ulster, North Ireland. Okay. So, the, the marriage that happened was one of the Melisan kings and one of Zedekiah's daughters. Okay, which is how this all ties in together. This is how it all ties right here. So now it's not it's not two different houses now. It now becomes one. It is now a unified Judah now coming down into the kings of Ireland and the kings of Scotland. Okay, but notice where they got married. So so the re they had a breach away from each other for how long? For twenty five hundred years. And so this line was followed in most of Bible history. This line right here um, didn't get the didn't get the attraction and the focus that it that it should have. Okay, but they got married. These two got married in Ulster, North Ireland. Now I I want to I want to just bring something to you here. <clears throat> Remember the Lord called me O'Hare? Y'all remember that? And I and I shared this with you here, um, that someone had uh, provided this for me, O'Hare, Irish from where? Right there. The Lord said that those people were representative of him. That's what he said. And he said that I was one of them. Take a look. So this right here, this marriage happened in Ulster, North Ireland. She married the prince of the Zara line after agreeing to leave the safety of northern Spain to travel for the marriage in Ireland. Now, that's pretty significant information. That's really, that is really bringing up some pretty interesting information. So, <clears throat> what's he trying to tell us? They are representative of him. They're representative of him. Guys, you need to seek the Lord on this. I'm telling you, it, you it's going to blow your mind, really. So Europe's Gaelic tribes and nations were established before Babylon, before Persia, before Alexander the Great, and the Roman empires. But the only nations now that still stand up for Europe's great Zerah Gaelic heritage with the original Jacob common laws is the commonwealth of nations under the British throne. This does not mean that they have a righteous king over them, um, but this means that they're under them. So let me double back and I'm just going to, um, I might have something up about the commonwealth. Let me see if I did. Um, I tried to keep, I tried to keep stuff up as I was going through studying and then would mark it. Um, yes, I did. Okay. Commonwealth. All right, so it's a body of people composed of one or more nationalities, usually with its own territory and government laws that will benefit all the citizens of the Commonwealth, okay? Um, that's not what I want. Let me see if I have. Yes, I do. Okay, um, usually countries within the Commonwealth are uh, former British colonies, but some countries such as Samoa, Papua New Guinea, uh, Nam Namibia, Australia, New Zealand, or South Africa, um, usually they had a um, an allegiance to them. After the war, many of the loyal loyalists, um, they stuck around with England, okay? Um, but it's my understanding there's quite, let's take a look here, the Commonwealth of Nations, normally known as the Commonwealth, is an intergovernmental organization of how many? 53 member states, okay? Um, I don't know if it's still 53 um, or what, but I'm going to tell you that's pretty, that's pretty significant. That's a big, that is a big um, 
amount of nations that are under that particular uh, commonwealth. Now remember, Abraham was Hebrew and he was given the promise, you will be a father of many nations. We are following the line of Zerah, okay? And what we're following is not the bloodline of the Jews. We're following the Hebrew tribes of Judah, okay? The Hebrew tribes of Judah. <clears throat> All right, let's go back. <clears throat> we're almost done. Um so this Gaelic culture goes back to the great Grecian stories of Athens, Troy, and the great Trojan Wars through the sons of Zerah. Okay, so Genesis 38, it tells us the story of Judah and, and Tamar's birth of these twins that were split into two different Judah historical timelines. Um, these are twins. These are the ones... Okay, now listen, this is what I read, and I and it's notated down, and I want to read it exactly as I saw it, because as soon as I saw it, I said, you have got to be kidding me. Okay. Judah and Tamar's birth twins split so that the Judah tribe is now into two different Judah historical timelines. And the reason why it's two different historical timelines is because they split they split from each other. There was a huge gap there for 2,500 years. And so when I read this statement, this is what I want to bring forth to you. These twins were also the sign of the coming messianic twins. Hear me? I'm going to repeat it again. This is not my statement. This is something that I read, and as soon as I read it, it jumped right off the page at me, and I need to read it to you. These twins were also the sign of the coming messianic twins. All right, guys. There's another one. That's not me saying it. That's somebody else saying it. And you guys can go and look that up yourself. In the story of Judah, Tamar bore these twins for Judah. Okay? The first twin, Zerah, remember, received a scarlet thread. But, the, but his brother was born first, which actually stole the, the birthright by coming out of the womb first. So Perez becomes the messianic bloodline, the golden lion of Judah. Zerah becomes the Gaelic Christian bloodline or scarlet red lion of Judah. Now, what are you talking about? Well, I'm getting ready to show you. So now this royal leadership, due to this particular birth issue, this, this wasn't healed until at least 2,500 years when the two bloodlines of Judah came, to get, came back together again um, in Northern Ireland through that marriage um, somewhere around 583 B.C., okay? And that planned marriage would reunite the crown over one Judah and prepare for all the Commonwealth nations to come. All right. So, um, <clears throat> we saw this, we saw, let's just see, can I go in here? Here we go. Let's go in here. Um, instead of pulling up some more scripture, I want to just read this article. It comes with a lot of different information in it. It, it offers the scriptures I would have given you anyway. So, the Royal House of Judah, T. Tephi, or the, the great-granddaughter uh, of Jeremiah, okay, we're going to call her T, in Ireland, and Scota in Scotland. So the Bible tells us um, that the house of David, descendants of Perez, the son of Judah, was taken captive in Babylon when the first temple was destroyed. King Zedekiah, who was a descendant of Perez, the son of Judah, was taken captive to Babylon also. When the temple fell, the prophet Jeremiah escaped with the king's two daughters, Scota and T, first to Egypt and then to Ireland. King Zedekiah's daughters married Milesian uh, kings. The Milesian kings were a descendant to Zerah, who was Judah's son also. Let's take a look. Oh, wait a minute. It's right here. Let's take a look. This is a different one than I have. 
I was excited to see it. I found this late yes, uh, late last night. <clears throat> All right. So here she is, uh, Zara, the house of Zara. I say here she is, but it's really it's a it's a guy. So here he is, um, out of his out of his line is the Milisan kings. Here's Zedekiah. Okay. And here is, excuse me, let me get that off of there. Here's Zedekiah, and here's what happened. And so he, they went into Northern Ireland. Here comes the, uh, uh, the king. This is right around the timeline that they get married, merging these two houses together. Okay, let's continue. The Malaysian kings were a descendant to Zerah, who was Judah's son also. Perez and Zerah were the twins born to Judah and Tamar. Now we know that. We're familiar with that. The ancient Irish, Irish records um, <clears throat> record the coming of the great prophet. Okay, His scribe Barak and the daughter of a king about 853 BC and that with them they brought the wonderful stone or stone of destiny. This stone today is referred to as to the coronation stone. <clears throat> Prophet Jeremiah remained in Ireland until his death and is buried there. His tomb is also in Ireland. Jeremiah's tomb has hieroglyphics that reflect this journey to Ireland. Queen Elizabeth II and all of the monarchs in Europe are descendants from the royal house of Judah, David. The various kings and queens of Russia, Germany, Austria, France, Poland, Sweden, etc. are all related to this royal house. <clears throat> so the fall of Jerusalem. The fall of Jerusalem is recounted in Jeremiah chapter 52. They slaughtered the, the, the sons of King Zedekiah so that they could not inherit the throne. The king was kept in prison until he died. Okay, so this is what happened. This was broken. This line was broken right there. It was done. There was no sons to, to, for heir. The daughters fled for their life. It was completely broken. Now remember, uh, remember back about the um, about the blessing that the scepter shall not leave the house of Judah, right? Uh, back in what was that Genesis 49 where he, where um, where all of the 12 sons were being blessed and given blessings um, and that was one of the reasons why I hit that one you need to go back and take a look at that um, because God did provide that there was something there for them so let's continue and read here what it says in Jeremiah 52 because this is just this is just astronomical so Jeremiah 52, uh, 3, and King Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. And in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, and in the tenth day of the month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came with all his army against Jerusalem and laid siege to it. And they built siege works all around. So the city was besieged till the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. And on the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine was so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. Then a breach was made in the city, and that all the men of war fled and went out from the city by night, and by the way of a gate between the two walls, by the king's garden, and the Chaldeans were around the city, and they went into the direction of Arabah. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho, and all his army was scattered from him. Then they captured the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah, to the land of Hamath, and and he passed sentence on him. The king of Babylon slaughtered, slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his very eyes, and also slaughtered all the officials of Judah. He put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him in chains, and the king of Babylon took him to Babylon and put him in prison till the day of his death. Um, this is just, I mean, think about it, guys. This is horrible. This is just horrible. So, um, so we know that Jeremiah got out of there. He got out of there with the daughters. Let's read. So, but Barak, Jeremiah's scribe, the son of Neriah, um, setteth thee on against us for to deliver us into the hand of the Chaldeans that, that they might put us to death and carry away captives into Babylon. So Johan, the son of Korah or Korea, 
And all the captains of the forces and all the people obeyed not the voice of the Lord, obeyed not the voice of the Lord to dwell in the land of Judah, <coughs> but obeyed them and took all the remnant of Judah who that were returned from all the nations, whether they, wherever they had been driven to dwell in the land of Judah, even men and women and children and the king's daughters, T and Scota, and every person that Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, had left with uh, Jildalia, the son, uh, okay, the son, the son, and Jeremiah the prophet and Barak the son of Neriah. And so they came into the land of Egypt, for they obeyed not the voice of the Lord, thus came even to the whatever. Okay, now guys, I need to tell you, um, I need to tell you that I read somewhere, some somewhere in something that I read, uh, maybe I heard it in that video, maybe I read it somewhere, or maybe it was both, um, but Solomon did not sit on that stone. He did not sit on that stone. And so it was his line, right underneath him, his line, that got, it, it got, it got, it got snipped out, snuffed out like a candle, just went, psh, that was it. That was the end of it. It was broken. They were trying to, they were trying to stop this line. The enemy was trying to stop this line. Um, but you know, God has a plan. He always has a plan. Look who's coming in. Okay. So there's something to this other side. Um, there's something very significant to this other side. Um, it is getting ready to lead us into the kings of uh, Ireland and Scotland. Remember, that was the dream that I had, and then it was confirmed by my friend Lou. Um, I was given information uh, from being in the spirit from the Lord about Ireland and all of that and O'Hare, and then she had sent me a dream that she had the tartan, and um, and it was dealing with Scotland. Um, I had the iron in my dream. She had the steel in her dream. And, um, and guys, so this is very, very significant. Um, we're, we're being shown things um, at this time. So here it is, Genesis 49. So the Bible reflects that Judah and the house of David will forever be on the throne. Okay. Moving the throne to Europe after the first temple was destroyed ensured Yahweh's promise would be kept. Genesis 49, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor will the ruler's staff from between his feet until he comes to whom it belongs. To him will the obedience of the peoples be. And so, um, and so go through and read this, but this is something here I want to read, this last little part here, and then we're going to look at something, uh, something else, and then we'll end this video. So Ezekiel's young twig prophecy fulfilled. <clears throat> now, I don't know if this was just in my study sometime back or if I actually provided this in a video, but I'm finding that it's, I'm finding, I'm finding it very interesting that it's being put up into my face again and I'm finally understanding it a little bit more. I know I was digging into this. Maybe was it because of the oaks that I was being, um, maybe it was the one about the oak trees that I was being led to. That could have been what it was, but this is, this is not the first time that I'm looking at the scripture. Okay. So there's something significant to it. It's being brought before me yet again. So Ezekiel's prophecy was fulfilled when tea was taken from Jerusalem and planted in Ireland. So um, Ezekiel 17, Nebuchadnezzar cropped off the top of his young twigs and carried into a land of traffic and he set it in a city of merchants. Thus says the Lord, I am, I will take the highest branch of the high cedar and will set it, I will crop it off from the top of its young twigs, a tender one, female, meaning Tia, T, and will plant it or her upon the high mountain and eminent in the British Isles. The mountain of the height of Israel will I plant it at Terah, and it shall bring forth bows and bear fruit and be a godly, a goodly cedar and under it shall uh, dwell all fowl of every wing in the shadow of the branches there thereof shall they dwell and the trees of the field shall know that i am have brought down the high tree for res in jerusalem okay listen to this so who brought it down remember god didn't like um uh uh, Judah's first son from another marriage, remember? Uh, God said he was an evil man and he killed him. 
And then the second son, Tamar, had to go with, and he didn't do as was instructed, um, and he died as well. And so listen to what verse 1724 says, And all the trees of the field shall know that I, the I am, have brought down the high tree, meaning the Perez line in Jerusalem. Um, because they have and have exalted the low tree, Zerah, in Ireland, uh, have dried up the green tree, the tribed house of Judah, and have made the dry tree, the tribed house of Israel, to flourish. The I am have spoken and have done it. Guys, pray on that scripture, please. I want you to pray on that. Um, <laughs> here we go. One went down and the other one's being elevated up. First is last. Last is first. Last is first. That's it. Last is first. Um, we're going to talk about that again a little bit more. So let's take a look. The coat of arms. Um, so in Ireland's coat of arms, it reflects a biblical history as well as their ancient Ireland story. King David's harp. Now, wait a minute. What's King David's harp doing over there? In the harp, one of the things that we heard that Jeremiah took out of, took out of um, took out of there took up to Ireland, right? He took the stone, he took a harp, he took the ark, and something else or whatever. Remember? Well, there you go. That's where it is. Isn't that something? Um, <laughs> the line the line of Judah's crowns is on the coat of arms. Let's take a look at this. So here's the harp. Here's the harp right here. The line of Judah's crowns. Here's Judah's crowns. Zerah's hand. Take a look at that. It's a red hand. Zerah's hand was a um, was a was a scarlet thread around the wrist by the hand, right? But isn't that isn't that something that that's his hand? And the Lord told me, he said, you are, you are mine forevermore. And I said, well, how is O'Hare playing into this and what have you? And he says, it is that I have you in the palm of my hand. As soon as I saw that that was a red hand, that was the very thing that came back to my mind that the Lord told me. I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. Oh, my goodness. So... um <laughs> So that's Zerah's hand. Simon's sword. The eagle from the tribe of Dan. Okay? Because that's where um, that's where they made their way. Not all of the tribe of Dan, part of them. Okay? Uh, very interesting. So this is their this is their uh, this is their what are they calling it? Coat of arms. Republic of Ireland coat of arms, and then the, this this particular uh, crest, I guess. I, I don't really know what else that, to call it. Uh, very interesting. So some say that this is Jesus' cross. And it could be representative of Jesus' cross. Um, but when I listened to that uh, three-hour video, um, he was describing the X and the, the cross like that. Um, in the British, in the British flag, he was describing that they had this and that they had the X also going over it. And he was saying that that was the Aleph Tav, the Aleph Tav. So I pulled up when I saw that um, and I saw here that that said Jesus's cross. Um, I said, yes, uh, it probably is. But then I wanted to go ahead and take a look at the Tav. Um, do I not have the Tav? Let me see if I have it somewhere else. Uh, Commonwealth. Oh, I probably lost it. Um, let's pull it up. Uh, let's see. I am ancient Hebrew Tav symbol. There it is. It's a cross. Hebrews, sign of God. Sign of God. Um, so Aleph is first and Tav is last. And who is last is first. Let's look. That's when I pulled it up here. Matthew 20. 
Is that Matthew 20? No. Why do I not have? Oh, gosh. Let's pull it up. Hmm. Um, let's go right. All right. So the parable of the workers in the vineyard. You guys know this. Um, for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. And now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he would pay every laborer a denarius a day, he sent them on to his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right I will give you. And so they went, and again he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle. And he said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. And he said, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right you will receive. And so when the evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, Call all the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when those came who were hired about the eleventh hour, they each received a denarius. But when the first came, uh, they supposed that they would receive more, and they likewise received each a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, These last men have only worked only one hour, but you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give to this last man the same as you. It is not lawful for me to do what I wish is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first, and the first last. For many are called, but few are chosen. So, okay, guys. Um, and that's going to end my study. Um, for today, there is more. It is coming. I don't know when I can get the next one out. Um, I'm going to try and do it as quickly as I can. However, it takes time, as you can tell, with all the backup and the explanation of everything. When you sit down, if you um, wish to embark upon that three-hour video, it is an ex it is an extremely inter interesting video. I would pull out a notepad. I would start taking notes upon it first. Um, I would definitely try and print off um, a copy of that um, of that chart, this particular chart right here, so that you can kind of keep in mind um, about a few things. He's going to show you this chart somewhere well, well, well within the video. Um, but you can find this just um, Google Royal House of Windsor, um, Judah, Zaraf, Ferez, um, Bloodline, or or uh, line or whatever and 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 put it in the images and you'll be able to find this as well or you can go into this particular um, uh, this particular um, kingdom here america dot blogspot dot com or our father's kingdom of america this particular article you'll see it right there um, so that you can um, have that as a copy for yourself um, but guys I'm telling you there's something super, super significant about what he's trying to show us. Go back and really, really pray upon Strong's 38. Um, he is definitely trying to show us here. This is something very, very important. Um, truly, truly important. Um, I want to just leave you with one last thing. Every time I have gone into my kitchen for the last four or five days or so. Um, I, I don't know why I'm just whistling a particular song, but I, I don't even whistle normally. I, that is not that is not me. I don't go around whistling, but for some reason, um, when I went into the kitchen, maybe to um, get a glass of water or to um, help prepare lunch for my in-laws or whatever, um, I would just start whistling a particular tune and I couldn't recall what in the world it was. Well, yesterday, I finally, I, it finally dawned on me what the song was, and I said, "Well, gosh, I need to go look that up." Um, and so I want to, I want to 
show you exactly what it was that has been on my mind. Um, now, I, I'm a big fan of Carol Burnett, but I don't watch TV um, all that much. And, of course, she's not on television anymore anyway. But um, but I, I, I really love the humor that she offered um, people. Uh, laughter is 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 great healing and um <clears throat> but the tune that i was whistling in my mind was was the sign off song that she sang on um, the last or yeah the last um show that she had on the air now um the lyrics to this is um i'm so glad we had this time together um, to have a laugh or two, uh, I want to I want to show you what we have here. This is not her. Um, this is not her channel. This is somebody else's channel that has put it up. So I'm I'm just going to go ahead and show um, what the video was here for her. It's about two minutes long, um, but I just need to put it out there for YouTube that this is being shared. Um, in, in, in a non-profit format. I'm not trying to make money on this at all. I'm just trying to share this as encouragement for the shortness of time that we have for teaching and for learning. And I'll go ahead and put that, um, put that information in my comments as well. So guys, taste, take a listen to this. And, um, so you'll know what song I have been whistling for about five days. I'm so glad we had this time together Just to have a laugh or sing a song Seems we just get started And before you know it Comes the time we have to sing so Okay, guys. So just a just a few thirty seconds of that is is about all I need to tell you. But that is the that is the tune that has been in my mind for the last five days. Um, don't ask me don't ask me why, but there it is, um, guys. The shortness of the hour. We it is late. It is late. So guys, please be seeking him, staying in front of him, um, continuing to press in with him. I'm going to try and come back as soon as I can. God bless you guys. Stay under his wing until we speak again. Bye.